All right, here he is back for the second time. My man, Brian Kramer, general manager of Toyota, Ger no, Germain Toyota of Naples. Got to make sure I get that right. Um, you've been, well, can I call you a pioneer? The last time you were on the show, we were talking about how you were the first one leading the charge to a an all paperless transaction. And now I've got you back a whole slew of questions about being the first, the first DPB gang, you hearing this? The first one to do a car sale in the metaverse. And I mean, for those of you that are watching this deal right now, you can see Brian's background is very metaverse-y. Thanks for, so much for joining me back on the Dealer Playbook Podcast. I've been looking forward to this for, for a while. We had a, a blast in the last one, so uh, this thing's going to be full throttle, I have a feeling. Yeah, exactly. And and Danielle, we hope you approve of the audio. But let's get into this uh, Got real quick. Got a new quick. mic, Danielle. <laughs> Got a new mic, Danielle. Um, so you and I were just chatting pre-show here, and I'm like, wait, we got to stop. We got to get into this because it, it just the conversation flowed so nicely into what I want to uh, talk to you about. But to give the the listener some context, we were kind of all over the map. We were talking about how connected the world is now, how easily you can touch base and build a relationship with anybody anywhere in the world. As you were saying that, uh, and you were giving some some examples of that, you know what thought crossed my mind is, I'll have to admit, when this whole, when, when, when the Zuck brought up the metaverse, there were two things that came to my mind. First thought was, here we go again. <clears throat> and the second thought was about Second Life, which is, is surprising that not a lot of people have ever heard of, but this, I think, started... Second Life was this, quote can I call it a game? It was a metaverse back in the day um, that came out in early 2000s and had pretty widespread adoption. I want to say like 900 million people. I'm, and I'm, I'm talking to a lot of people that are talking about it. I, I, I wasn't on it. I think it's because of uh, I was going from dealership to dealership right. and I wasn't in the loop, but it's an, I don't think a lot of people were comfortable saying that they were in it back then. It wasn't right. socially acceptable. Yeah. I mean, people had it literally second lives in there. They were getting married in there. They were having little babies, you know, <laughs> anyways, but I remember hearing about it from a guy named Lon Safko who wrote the social media Bible. And I mean, this book is as thick as a Bible and, and it was his presentation at an automotive conference that introduced me to this concept um, what I thought particularly fascinating about the whole idea is, yeah, you're an avatar. You can be whatever you want. You're maybe, a, a, I don't know, a custodian in real life. But in Second Life, you're a neurosurgeon and, you know, you've got um, gazillions of dollars and a big mansion and all those sorts of things. So you're basically living vicariously through your avatar. But what I thought was interesting leading up to this conversation is the fact that uh, Obama's campaign got involved and there were they set up campaign offices in Second Life where people could go and learn about his campaign. Pizza Hut was set up in there so you could your avatar could order a pizza in in Second Life and 30 minutes later pizza, real pizza showing up at your doorstep. And so when Zuck came out and he was like we're going heavy into metaverse and all of the conversations in the automotive community started happening I was like here we go again. However, we are, and I want your thoughts on this. This is the longest intro to any podcast now. Too, too much Cirillo talking, but it's like, I want to get your thoughts on this because it seems like we're going deeper and deeper and deeper into the, the world of the metaverse or the concept of the metaverse, bigger than probably even we could anticipate through Second Life. What's your take? So, you know, I've, I've read a bunch of people reach out to me after after we did that transaction. And I've met some very interesting people from all different type walks of life, right? That were doing something that just now got into the space, and, it, and it's already explosive. But if you if you look at uh, Deloitte, Ernst and Young, all at McKinsey, they all say that last year, 2021, it was a 22 billion dollar business, the metaverse. They're saying that next year, this year, 2022, it's supposed to be third, uh, 38 billion. Wow. And they're saying that by 2000. 26 it's supposed to be 765 billion and i just the, an article came out last week uh by city group because city chase 
they've all got their white papers as to what they see in terms of the potential for this. Right. I'm going to be talking about that here, uh, you know, digital dealer next month. They city uh, forecast a $13 trillion market cap on the metaverse by 2030. Holy smokes. They said it's going to make the growth yet. The growth will be more exponential. It'll make the internet look like a, a little a star, you know, solar flare compared to this being the big bang. Wow. So, so I think about when Jeff Bezos, they said, how, how did you know to create Amazon? And all I keep on thinking about as I, everybody's like, we know, why are you even investing all that time and all that energy into it? And, you know, when you and I talked about all the elements of the paperless transaction last time, mm -hmm. and they say, how are you able to do this metaverse? Well, it's all the stuff where he said, why are you doing all that? So the plumbing had already been laid. It was actually pretty easy. I mean, it was a little bit of friction on that transaction, but it was pretty easy. But when we go back to this Jeff Bezos thing, they said, how did you know? And he goes, I just knew that everything I said, I, I read said that there was going to be 700% uh, lift in internet growth. And that's where all the growth was going. So I quit my job and I knew I had to be in that. And I didn't know where it was going, but I knew it was going somewhere and that I needed to be a part of it. And I, I feel the same way about this, but even more so. Yeah. And, and I mean, here's where my brain goes. I, I, like, is it a hard thing to wrap my head around? No. Is it for some? Yes. And what do I mean by that? I like, we're in the metaverse right now. Just right. because you and I are talking to each other and see the real, you know, representation of ourselves through camera and all that. That doesn't mean we're not in the metaverse. Like we're in it right now. This podcast is how you, you said to me, why don't we do this podcast in the metaverse? I'm not going to lie, dude. I went into De Decentraland, whatever you call it, and I got a house there now. I got all this stuff. I created an auditorium. I was like fully prepared for us to do But then I, I'm not going to lie. My brain said, but if we do this through StreamYard or we do this online in some way, it's already happening in the metaverse. It's just not happening in one of those worlds, but it's happening. And and so curious your take on that. Is that how you're seeing it? Or is there something even deeper to the concept of the metaverse that that I'm not picking up on? I mean, that's a lot, a, a lot in that question. <laughs> but as far as the presentations are concerned, yeah. I know I've attended some concerts, I've attended some Heineken product launches, I've attended some Samsung, I was in this Acura uh you know, gold puffy jacket NFT grab right. very recently. And it was like a, an adrenaline rush. It was like a, like back when nightclubs used to, there used to be like a rave that would come, you know, years ago. And it was like, where is this thing? Everybody would communicate. It wasn't publicly advertised. So you felt like you were part of the inside group and you would show up there. But in some of those, I mean, it's very immersive and you can do it from, you know, they say omniverse, you know, like just like we're doing it now in 2D or you put the goggles on or what's coming shortly with, uh, you know, uh, augmented reality where you'll be able to see, you know, a lot more, have some sort of combination of the two. But I think that there's a couple different elements of the metaverse and, and there's gaming, which some people are attracted to. Obviously, you know, I, I you know, played Grand Theft Auto back when I was younger and right. for stuff like that. But <clears throat> but now I'm in you know, more interested in the financial aspects of it, the business transactional piece, which I think are limitless. And I know that when Grant Cardone told me in 2011, 2012, his social media strategy, and I kind of scoffed at it. And I said, I'm just not seeing it, you know, which I, I'm just going to commit to one of them. I think I'm going right. to commit to LinkedIn. He goes, each one's going to be different. That might be like going to church, but then Facebook is going to be that for, used for this. And I'm like, it sounds like a lot of noise. He goes, I'm telling you, I'm going to build a real estate empire with it. So that, that me being dismissive of that haunts me to this day. <laughs> so this feels the same way that felt. So I'm not going to put myself in that situation again. And I think that from a business a aspect, it's going to allow people to connect in ways we never imagined before. I think it's that the retail part of the car business is going to get away from transactional price payment, all that sort of thing. And it's going to become more experiential and the brand connection and what you can do with even the legacy pieces of the brand. You know, in Toyota's case, they've got TRD. They've got all these right. heritage pieces. They get, I'm at Lincoln uh, as well next door. And they've got the 100-year anniversary. So being able to immersively take somebody back in and, and, and meet with Henry Ford as an avatar and communicate with him and, and tell the story of Ford and how Lincoln was, you know, came about or whatever for their 100th year. I mean, there's so many different things that you were 
able to do that. It's not limited, you know, taking virtual test drives because we're probably never going to see ground stock come back to the levels like it was before. Right. I mean, Mike Manley from AutoNation just said it's never going to come back to that. And those inventory levels are, will never happen again. So finding other ways to accomplish a test drive with haptic gloves and augmented or virtual reality in a showroom so you don't need to have all the ground stock. Um, having technicians be able to use augmented reality glasses and have, you know, technicians by after they've been in the business 20 years, their shoulders are shot. Right. They've been hauling tires and doing all that stuff, but they still have so much mental knowledge that they can pass through for them to be mentors and be able to look through a technician's uh, lens, literally, and walk them through and color code here, do this, do that. Or the training that comes with building all that out is limitless. Or how about the training applications of training dealership associates? If you could have everybody go to a centralized forum, like what you're talking about, an auditorium, and you don't have to have all the flights, all the travel, because that's typically the barrier to entry. We don't want to fly everybody to Atlanta or we don't fly everybody right. to Dallas. Yep. And being able to just take everybody and put them in there. And I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, this is the end. This is it. No more human interaction. <clears throat> They're going to reach Michael Cirillo's goal where everybody's going to be wearing iPads with duct tape. <laughs> and that's going to be the apparel, uh, which you could do with an, you know, an NFT of that in the metaverse. We should probably yep. should. But even though everybody per perceives that, I, I really believe because when my kids, if we're we were canoeing the other day with Oculus 2 goggles on through the, you know, in Botswana during the great migration in Africa. And right. my my daughters can't get on their phones and check Snapchat or TikTok. Right. That I have their undivided attention and I can interact with them or if I'm playing sports with them in there. I think it actually lends to really having somebody's undivided attention in ways mm. that a mobile device doesn't allow. And I really, I, I think that it's actually going to enhance true dedicated uh, communication and allow salespeople, service advisors to communicate, not with goggles on, but with a three-dimensional, uh, you know, image, because that's really all it is. You've been in Decentraland. That's a, that's like Google front, you know, page one of SEM. Right. <clears throat> and what happens with SEM if everybody's going through and they're looking at billboards in Decentraland, is that a SEM grab? Is it SEO? Is it Google Analytics 4? <laughs> What's the events that track, you know, you can't, you, how do you retarget through there? I mean, there's so much stuff that's happening. It's, uh, I'm, it's just a great time to be alive. Yeah, I think about, I can't remember who said it. I was having a conversation with Glenn Lundy. He mentioned the name a futurist, one of the foremost futurists. And he basically talked about how in the next 100 years, we will see 2,000 years worth of innovation. So, I totally believe that. Yeah, which, which if you think about it then, if we're going to see 1,000 years, 2,000 years worth of innovation in 100, what does that mean for the next five years? We're, we're, we're going to see a hundred years worth of innovation in the next five. That's how fast things are ramping up. And to your point, I, I don't think people realize, yes, it, we have this tendency to go doom and gloom. Oh, that's it. No more human interaction. Really? Because what, what, we're just not going to exist? Like we're not going to leave our houses anymore? No, I don't think so. To your point, I really do think it's going to be much more about the experience, uh, which aligns already with, um, you know, a lot of the data that we've been seeing from companies like AutoFi, uh, Chip Perry's A to Z, uh, Sync, um, that this generation of car buyers, whether it's Gen Z, uh, Gen Z for all my Canadians, uh, um, millennials, they're more interested. Uh, they're they're going to become more loyal. Let me let me think. How how do I want to say this? There are signals that suggest they're more loyal to experience, less loyal to a brand. Hundred percent. So you could be, heaven bless you, a Mitsubishi dealer in North America, and win on experience. Tesla's doing that now. Tesla right. is not the highest ranked JD Power vehicle by right. a long shot. Right, people want to be associated with that brand, what it represents. It is not the most reliable. It's definitely not the easiest vehicle to drive. If you think about it, you can't. You know, everybody knows how to drive a combustion engine, 
And right. You don't need to have a charge point account in order to put fuel in your vehicle. You mm-hmm. don't have to set up the app online and all the complicated stuff that goes with it. <clears throat> and and all the things that are that are about to just take over this industry, it's all, you know, relatively simple. The other things that are going to happen, well, and think about it, you know, at electric EV charging stations. I was just coming across Alligator Alley right next to Swamp Billy's Safari, <laughs> where the alligator wrestling is. Right, and they've got sixteen Tesla stations, either the high the high speed charge and the low speed charge. There's no, uh, you know, gas station attendant. It's just. And, you know, they're making money off the data. Now, there is one, right. you, know, you know, about a block over, but they're giving, allowing, you know, free Wi-Fi. They're taking that data. They're selling it. They're retargeting you ads. And we're, they're going to, what did I hear the other day? 60% of the jobs that are going to be around when my daughters graduate from, my daughter Ava's 15, my daughter Morgan's 11. When they graduate from college, which won't be very long, that 60% of the jobs that they'll be looking at don't currently exist. Wow. And if you think, you know, you're a few years younger than I am, but the people that I went to high school with, a bunch of them got marketing degrees. And they got marketing degrees in newspaper advertising, radio, all the magazines, periodicals, all right. that sort of stuff. In you you graduated life. when? 86? <laughs> right. <laughs> a little bit after that. But, uh, we had, you know, at least I had Microsoft and Carta instead of the World Book Britannica and all. So, so. At, right as they were doing that, four years after they just spent all the money on on their education, their their world got flipped upside down with the internet, and they were obsolete that quickly. And it wasn't like it was somebody who'd been doing it for twenty years. They ha- didn't even get started, and it was already over. And I think we'll see a lot more of that coming about. And you know, with the gas station attendants, I also just drove through in this in the toll booths and Sun Pass. They don't have any people working the toll booths anymore. Maybe one. Now right. they can say, oh, you're eliminating jobs and getting rid of that. But how many other jobs did it create? And that's the one thing that most people don't don't talk about is, um, you know, what new jobs are created, at, you know, out of that situation. Right. And how much more the economy is bolstered rather than, to your point, focusing on the law of scarcity and what your, you know, small things you're giving up. What, how many people are highly engaged and happy sitting in a toll booth on Alligator Alley? For eight hours a day talking that's right yeah it allows them to to do something they do can be passionate about yeah and to your point i love the see what i love about this conversation and and about what you're saying in particular is you're demonstrating that you as a leader have an abundance mindset you're immediately saying but think of the new job that this will this will create um Things move fast, but they also kind of move slow. Here, here's what I mean by that. Like, I'm pretty sure they realized they needed to get out of attending toll booths after they watched The Godfather. They're like, <laughs> they're like, dude, whoa, man, Sonny, Sonny would still be alive if they had Easy Pass, right? You know, so would the, <laughs> so would the, the attendant in the toll booth for crying out loud. It took them 30 years, 35 oh. years to be like, or 40 years to be like, eh, maybe, maybe that if that guy was an engineer, he wouldn't have to be sitting in that toll booth. He wouldn't have got lit up, you know, but, but it, but things happen fast. If you're not paying attention, I find that they happen at a relatively steady, much more manageable pace. If you are paying attention and, and so Everything that's happening to me doesn't seem frightening because that's like I've been paying attention to it. You've been paying attention to it. So the concept of the metaverse, the concept of you doing a transaction in the metaverse, yeah, cool, big deal. But 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 it probably didn't seem like that much uh, like that big of a deal to you having, as you said earlier, already laid out the plumbing for this type of a thing to happen because you were in the moment. You were experiencing it. This is the next logical thing to try and test and prove. Here's the analogy, as you're saying that, that comes to my mind. Would Netflix have been, would they have the infrastructure and been able to jump into streaming and be able to convert? Because because they could have also become blockbuster when they went away from DVDs. They had to make a choice. Do they remain, Do they stick to DVDs in the mail right. order business model? Or do they evolve? Because if not, Disney Plus, Paramount Plus, HBO Max knocked them off the pedestal. Right? right, because somebody's always innovating, and somebody's always come, you know, gunning 
before. You just you can't get too comfortable, and that's what car dealers are notoriously bad at. Now they're very, notoriously resilient at overcoming right. it, but, but waiting too long to do it. Yeah. So what do we what do we do? Do you, do you? Oh gosh, I don't want to get all doom and gloom here, um, but but I kind of and I'm not a. I'm not like a fear monger, but I, I think it's worth discussing since part of this conversation is a little bit of the unknown. In context to we're going to see a hundred years worth of innovation in the next five. I know that there's companies already out there. Toyota might be one of them that's looking at how to how, like battery cells that just re-energize themselves. Like we're, we're all sitting here going, we're never going to have the infrastructure for all EV vehicles by 2030 and companies like Toyota and stuff like that. They're like, dude, you're never going to have to plug this thing in it. Like we're, we're you're there. Cause you're used to the gas pump concept. That's cute. We're on, we're like Tony Stark level here, like renewable energy that creates itself. Bada bing, bada boom. Also They're working look on at all the new jobs that were created. Almost like magnetic strips under the asphalt. that will be an inch under the ground there's a mile test strip that a bunch of manufacturers are using to test this out where it charges the vehicle. Actually they're in Norway all over the place. And wow. as the car drives over it, it's, it's by whatever, not, not Bluetooth, but something like that. It's charging the vehicle above it to where it really doesn't need to be charged. And that technology is only going to get more and more advanced. Right. I mean, they don't uh, in Norway, they don't have their, it's all EV. And how did they right. do it? Right. They, you didn't have to pay sales tax for that's a quick way. Right. If they really want to make something happen and the government seems to really want to make it happen, it's probably going to happen. <clears throat> but I, the biggest disruption is going to be who trains the sales staff on this. If a, if a customer comes in today in most dealerships in North America, they're going to walk in, they're going to ask about an EV. What's the difference between a Tesla and this, you know, ICE model. And the salesperson is going to try to flip them to their comfort zone rather than understanding the benefits and the, you know, the cost analysis of both and trying to identify the range and how, what they're trying to accomplish. But we're, we're not equipped for that. We're also not equipped back in the shop in order to diagnose those based on right. the amount of growth that's going to come in or the fact that you come in at, you know, you always come in every 5,000 miles for your oil change. Well, there's no oil. Right. right. So, and all the other stuff, do you, does your car, since the, there's no engine, does it, or it's a different propulsion system. Is right. there a depreciation based on the percentage of the battery or wear and tear or how does that work? And the yeah. other interesting thing that comes out of, out of all of that is <clears throat> when you're thinking about depreciation, you're thinking about the average cost and, and how all that looks, you know, forget about the, I know the naysayers and I, and I'm not, I don't own an EV. Uh, I think it's premature, but it's right. definitely coming and not being prepared for it is a Yeah. Is, you're not, you're not just writing it off. You're right. saying, hey, not yet. Like Microsoft 11, I'm just going to stick with Microsoft. I'm going to stay with Windows 10 for a minute, even though 11's out. But I'm still building out landing pages. I'm building out, okay, what's the training going to look like? What's the percentage going to be? How many people do I have to hire for this? What Do I need to bring that in through a separate channel if the leads come in? Do I need to have a separate team for that? All these things that a lot of people, because it's painful to think about change. And like, ah, we have, we're, you know, there's only four days left in the month. We need to knock out this, you know, we'll deal with that later. And right. then it never happens until there's an OEM mandate. And they say, oh, by the way, hey, if you want to receive EV vehicles, like, you know, Ford has another channel and everybody else is going to have one of those here soon. In order to receive this allocation, which, by the way, is going to become more and more of your business, you're going to have to sell cars this way. You're going to have to do this <laughs> with this. You're going to have to figure this out. And then they're going to get blindsided and it's coming. And right. that wolf is coming in to blow your house down. So you need to start getting mortar and bricks and doing it now. Yeah. You're, so you're not, you're not in the group of, oh, OEMs are just going to take everything in house. There's not going to be a need for dealers. No, but I was just at a, at a meeting, had a conversation about this. And here's what they said it's going, it's going to look like. <clears throat> There's currently 18,000 new car franchises in the United States. Right. Of those 18,000, they're owned by 8,000 dealers, different mm -hmm. dealers, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. They're saying that there's actually probably going to be more dealerships because the infrastructure is needed and it's a competitive advantage over Tesla, Rivian, all those companies. But the amount of dealers owning them, the consolidation that's about to occur 
they think that by 2025, it's going to go down from 8,000 to 6,500 owners that, that share those 18,000 franchises. Because right. this EV, those that are unwilling to deal with the change or the infrastructure, and it's going to be, I think, a huge upswing for some, and it's going to be overwhelming for others, and there's going to be the you know great consolidation, if you will. Right. I need to, this is, I don't know that I've ever publicly said this, but at some point in time, I don't care if I find a dealer who's willing to take like 20 grand a year from me just so I can buy a fraction of a percentage of a dealership. And just like when I'm 60, I'll own like 3%. But I just, I know I need to be deeper in this business model because of exactly what you just said. Whether I'm buying in for an exit strategy because a bigger group's going to consolidate, want to, you know, consolidate and, and, or, you know, like whatever it is, like I just know that there's a place for me. Um, and I just think it would be really cool to be like agency, tech company owner, podcaster turned dealer. You know what I mean? Like there's just something about that that I think would be so tremendous. But I'm like, I got to either buy a store somehow in the sticks in, Doglick, Nebraska, or I need to find a real forward thinking dealer who's just willing to take some of my money year over year to like buy a little percentage, you know, like a fraction of a, I don't know what it looks like. Or a private equity firm that are, you know, all over the place now that are, that are fueling a lot of this, this growth. Mm, Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. See, I felt comfortable bringing it to you because you are kind of, can we call you, are you prepared yet to be called the industry's futurist? I'm not prepared for that. They, people call me a lot of things that are not as kind, but I, I, I appreciate that one. Yeah, no, I, I think, I think this is where we're leaning. And I, and I think, I think you should write a book, you know, I really think you should write. A book. I, think, I think it's probably time to uh, probably for everybody who's on this call, uh, Michael's put me on the spot. Cause I, I, last time we did this, uh, I told him I had a book called galvanized that was almost done and it's still, it's still not, but it's going to be, it's going to be coming out here shortly. So now it's on the record. Oh man. Accountability mechanism it's with it's like 75 in 68 countries. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. Um, no, this is fascinating to me. Um, I love the way that you're thinking about this because it is not doom and gloom. It really resonates with me. Okay, yeah, maybe fewer owners, but more dealerships. That's actually an interesting concept because it's so contrary to, it is kind of a contrarian point of view in in this concept of like, oh, but yeah, there's 18,000 dealerships, but be prepared for that to go to half. You know, there's going to be some sort of a dealership slaughter going on. So I really like that refreshing take. And to your point, a competitive advantage against the Rivians and the Teslas of the world. Also, so many uh, um, things that we haven't anticipated yet, but that we should be leaning into to the earlier point of if you're just paying attention, this is what happens. We, we get inspired and that moves us forward. You know, I, I think you could say, and may, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but you were inspired somehow to say, hey, I really like that idea. What can I do with this? And the next thing you know, you've got a paperless transaction and then you go, oh, this is really interesting. Um, maybe maybe my wife's right and I am a bigger nerd than I thought I was. And next thing you know, you're selling cars in the metaverse. I'll tell you the funny story about how that metaverse thing happened. So when Mark Zuckerberg comes out and he's talking about the the metaverse, <clears throat> I was using it more as a punchline because it was it was great clickbait and, and, right. and uh internet, you know, social media posts. So we were on a shopping spree with the, with the Jermaine, with Rick Jermaine was, it took us up and uh, took us to a mall outside. It was, it's a thing that he does every year, which is amazing for the top performers. So we're having cocktails. We're feeling no pain going from store to store. All the uh, top salespeople, top managers get X amount of money and they got to spend it you know, before they, they get back on the bus at the end of the evening. So we go into Best Buy and Lindsay Downs, one of our top salespeople is with us. And she said, I, you know, I, I got to figure out what else I should buy. I said, I would get that Oculus too. She goes, what is that? I go, they're, they're VR goggles. She goes, what does it do? I said, it takes you into the metaverse. And I'm like chuckling as I'm saying it. And she goes, what am I going to do with that? I said, well, I don't know. Why don't you get that? We'll figure out how to sell cars in there. So then she and Rick Germain and I took a picture and we said, buy your next car in the metaverse. And it was more of a joke just because we were 
you know, drinking. And right. we were killing ourselves about it. So then afterward, you know, a few few of the other managers were like, hey, what what is that? Or is that what we're doing next? And I said, well, I don't know. What would it look like? And it was in a manager's meeting. You know, Wendell Hardy of GSM, he's like, hold it. Because he, he is very good at keeping us on the rails because I can take the staff off the rails real quick. <laughs> And he goes, hold on a second here. You know, get adults are in the room. I got to keep everybody on track. And I said, well, no, but why, if we're already doing this, what's the difference between a CTA that's on a website? What's, what's the difference between a CTA that's in a DR tool and a CTA that's in the metaverse? And then all of a sudden, you know, all my managers that are 15 years younger than me and, you know, crypto uh, tuned in and they're the ones that taught me all this stuff. And they said, wait, what is this now? And I go, so tell me what, like, how, like, what should it look like? Why can't we do this? And they said, okay, because there's, their brains are stretched out from that paperless experience. Yeah. And they go, you know what? We, that we probably, we might be able to figure this out. You know, so it was, it has to be an after hours project where it can't interfere with work hours, you know, cause that's right. very easy for that to hijack and take over the, the core reason why we're here. Right. But, Everybody wanted to do it. it was voluntary. It wasn't mandatory. And we drew it out, mapped it out. Jared Kill was like, this is how you would connect it. This is this. And what phases will we do? You know, next we're going to be doing, uh, you know, a dealership in Roblox, which is where my daughter spends a lot okay. of time in yeah. Bloxburg. So everybody can stay tuned for that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> why are we doing that? I don't know. I want to, there's, it's like Brian Benstock says about return on learning versus return on investment. Our return right. on learning from that paperless, I can I can tell you was a seven figure number now, because of the cost savings and error reduction with chargebacks, with paper, with just all the different things that go along with it. Because that's actually very similar to blockchain or a smart contract. With now I look back in retrospect, right? But it also allowed us just to plug it into the metaverse. And as we plug it into sandbox, decentraland, spatial.io. And all the other stuff, you know, Meta Hero and, and Everdome.io, all the stuff that hasn't even really, that people are thinking about, the exponential $13 trillion worth of ideas that haven't yet been released, and how it's all going to run on crypto and built with NFTs and all this, I mean, super cool artificial intelligence taking over all the redundant tasks that nobody wants to do anyway, and allow us to focus on, that's why there's going to be so much, like Glenn said, so much innovation, because AI will take care of all the task-based boring stuff that's repetitive and allow right. us to really innovate and have fun and be engaged and make it not about the money, make it about the experience. This is why it's not such a foreign concept to me. <clears throat> like if you have employees, then you already understand the concept of automation, right? Like the, the fact that I have a team who can do their job and they can, they can do it well and they're focused means ultimately that me as a founder, having had to do all of their jobs at one point, they, because of their focus, they actually become more effective at their jobs than I ever could be, right? Because they're focused. And then I don't have to do it anymore. Um, I can focus my brain, my attention, talents, abilities on bigger stuff, right? And, and different stuff. And so that's autom isn't that automation? Just Yes. And everybody, for instance, when I talk to other dealers their biggest fear is, well, you're trying to replace my job with a robot or, right. you know, use this software to appraise a car. Oh, so you can just eliminate my job. And it's, not, it's quite the opposite. And it's just harnessing technology. It's like what happened at Disney with those magic bands and, oh, you're just trying to get eliminate humans. No, we just right. want you to delight more customers. But Jason right. Stein from Automotive News or formerly of Automotive News just said a couple of days ago at something I was at, he said, you know, there's this huge fear around EVs and the technology and how it's coming about or whatever. He said, but what's the real difference between an EV? Cause everybody's overwhelmed with, Oh, you got to do this and do that. He said, all it is is a different propulsion method to move a vehicle. That's it. He said, everybody's losing their minds over this. And instead of putting gasoline in it, you're charging it. Or right. when I say to people all the time about the metaverse, it's not it, to your point, it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's a lot to it and we could go deep into the weeds on it. But at the end of the day, it's just a different CTA. And I always say it's like an irrigation system. I put a bed in the back of my backyard in order to make sure that all, you know, the heat and Florida doesn't die. I run one 
plumbing line, a PVC pipe with three sprinkler heads back there that just spray back there. And the, it's not like I had to reinstall my whole irrigation system. I just have to tap into it right. because I've already done all the heavy lifting that needed to be done. And But everybody resisting paperless transaction or digital retail, is it going to stick? That's the price of admission. <laughs> and if you don't have that, that stuff done, then all this other stuff is, is overwhelming and yeah. it's hard to wrap your mind around. So that, yeah. that heavy lifting needs to be completed. Yeah, I mean, gosh, anybody who's been following my, me on LinkedIn, the, I, I mean, I've gotten messages where people are like, I thought you loved the car business. I'm like, I'm, I do. This is why I'm posting the things that I'm posting. To your point about price of admission, if I have to sit on hold for 29 minutes and people go, why would you ever do that? And I say, well, because I needed something very specific from this store that only they could provide. Oh, yeah. So, so if you're still not inspecting today processes, I'd be worried. But if you're focused on those things, imagine what a 29-minute hold time would look like in the metaverse, dude. You're, it, it would just be like <laughs> somebody's avatar walking up to another avatar and being like, Hey, can you help me? And then that avatar just looking at, like this dead avatar just staring back at them for 29 minutes, which actually brings us closer to an in-store experience. Because if you would never <laughs> leave somebody hanging for 29 minutes in this verse. I read that post that you're talking about. Yeah. And I that was my store three years ago. And I know what, what you're saying and what used to happen. Right. Because I had an issue like with cancellations. I'll just use that as an analogy. I know it's not exactly the same. But sure. Right. People would call up and I would, but I didn't have the technology to be able to identify it. People, the number one call initially uh, three years ago at my dealership was, is my, my temp tag's about to expire. What do I do? I had a horrible process. Now we register the vehicle digitally. We plate the car. Now it was a little bit more work. Everybody's like, oh, how much more stuff are you going to put on me? But th those, all those calls stopped. Then the next one was cancellations. I just want to cancel my warranty. It's right. not a lot, but then when, when the finance managers are always with customers, we yep. flip it to their voicemail. They don't check it <clears throat> because customers are more important. We were routing it to the wrong thing. All we had to do on both of them is put it on our website, frequently asked questions. My temp tags is about to expire. What do I do? When they call us, it's because we didn't have the information on the website. We didn't educate it. And a lot of dealers I used to be one of them, don't want to put all that stuff on there because they go, well, hey, that gives me another opportunity to sell my car if they call me. But mm. eliminating the friction set, promotes brand loyalty and retention, which is what needs focus. Yes, yes. And, and this is, this, oh my gosh, we just walked into a perfect use case for the dealer who, for, for those listening who are like, I still don't understand metaverse automation. You're trying to get rid of my job. What'd you just say? You just said as the leader, Oh, what are you guys trying to do? You're trying to put more more work on us? No, we're actually trying to streamline. Imagine if you could streamline all of that and get people to what they needed as quickly as possible with as much accessibility as possible so that you, to your point earlier, can focus on the work that actually is worth your time. So people go, well, but what, you know, for me, it wasn't a temp tag. I was selling my Hyundai Palisade and I posted it on Marketplace. I had no clue what the response was going to be like. Yes, okay, but oh, but Cyril, I thought you knew the industry had precedent at times. Yeah, but you don't expect 48 people to say, I will give you above your asking price right now. Wow. So why did I call the dealership? Well, I called the dealership that I bought the vehicle from because, um, you know, in a shuffle, I lost my bill of sale. And I just, so they answer the phone promptly, you know, second ring kind of a thing. That's great. Hey, you don't happen to ha get me a copy of my original bill of sale or just a copy of my bill of sale. Oh yeah, we could do that for you. Um, just got to pass you through to your point, Brian, uh, to, uh, Brian, to the finance manager. 29 minutes later, I need it because I've got three people showing up to my house to buy the vehicle. Like, you know, I need this thing. I mean, they're going to need it. So that's why I stay on hold. 29 minutes later, um, Sarah, you were holding for... No, no, no. I said 29 minutes ago, you put me on hold. 
because I need the bill of sale. I'm so sorry, our um, this is not an excuse, but our finance managers are busy assisting customers. I said, this is why I said, I'm gonna pause you right there. I'm a customer. <laughs> I, I gave y'all sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> Or whatever the car, sixty five thousand dollars. You, and I, you and I, had- I'm preaching to the choir, but you know that there's somebody <laughs> who's not busy at that location at that moment that's equipped to be able to provide that information, yes. and that receptionist is not empowered to make not that empowered. decision. And it's the same way when somebody comes in at seven o'clock in the morning. Hey, I just bought a car two days ago. I got a service contract, and I got this wheel that I'm supposed to get this X Y Z the second key or whatever. Well, hold on. We got to wait till the finance comes in. When do they come at nine o'clock? But I've got this thing signed off on right here. Yeah, but we have to verify it in the system that the money's set up on the on the deal, and all of those things that happen with that, or the fifty four hundred calls that I get every month currently. That yep. I want to know if the status update on my vehicle while it's in for service. Yep. And <clears throat> so that's where we're building that pizza tracker. But all of those things, I don't think a finance manager is the most of, is the bright person to handle that equation. Now, could that be one of these other positions that gets freed up by taking AI and automating all this monotony that you could have more people delighting clients like that? Absolutely. And that's 100%. where I think it's going is people that can give people immediate response instead of putting them into the, you know, the call queue of hell. Yep. hundred percent. That's, that's the job it's going to replace because that job didn't need to exist to begin with. That's that's what I'm getting from. Uh, that's what I'm picking up from what you're putting down. Man, this has been so much fun. We could talk about. I want to talk about this forever. I'm going to have to come and visit you in your store, and we're going to have to. We're going to just have to set up cameras, and we'll invite other people. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that digital dealer. Who knows? And we'll just like say, All yes, right, no holds barred. Let's do something. Let's talk about this and go, go super deep. And, you know, and I'm glad we went in the direction we did because un- undoubtedly, if the mass issue right now is we can't answer the phone properly, then they don't want to know the lines of code that had to be written for you to facilitate. You know what I mean? I do because it's super nerdy and I, I sit and code for fun because I'm just that guy. But um, but you know, the concept really, the big takeaways for me, Brian, is you've been laying a foundation consistently over time with two steps forward, maybe one step back, maybe five steps back, but three steps forward. And you're, you've continued to lean into streamlining, improving, making more efficient, questioning every aspect, but does it have to work that way? And that's really what I wanted to get to the heart of with you because you are you are, you heard it here first, the automotive futurist. And uh, so I'm excited that you, you're on the show. How can those listening get in touch with you and, and follow you? I'm on uh, LinkedIn under Brian Kramer, YouTube, Brian Kramer, uh, Instagram, Kramer, Brian, Facebook, TikTok, which last time I was on, we were joking about that TikTok. And that's uh, the way that I was laughing about being on TikTok the last time, and now it's not weird, is the way that we'll probably do another one of these in the future at some point, and and the metaverse won't seem weird either. Yeah, exactly. And and I will be, my avatar will be wearing a zebra costume. Yeah, exactly. I'm going with two dragons like in Starsky and Hush. Yeah, there you go. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks, Mike.